Our next speaker is Sebastian Bell, um, Executive Director of the Maine Aquaculture Association. And I think, as Michael put it really eloquently, Maine embodies almost all the imaginable successes we can imagine in the, in the coastal aquaculture industry. And so it's going to be great to hear from someone where the rubber actually meets the road. I'm not sure what the right metaphor is for <laughs> coastal aquaculture, but maybe Sebastian has that. We ain't finished yet. Uh, so thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, my name is Sebastian Bell. I run a, a farmer's trade association. We have 190 farms in the state of Maine. Um, we generate between 70 and $100 million worth of farm gate product on any given year. We employ around 650 people year round. And we uh, produce something on the order of 40 million meals a year for the American market. Um, so we are small by American standard, uh, by uh, world standards. We are relatively large by American standards. Um, we trade places between Hawaii, Florida, and Washington State to be the number one marine aquaculture state in the country, depending on who has a good year or a bad year. Um, I'm going to try and, and cut my time short because I think you've got some folks that have got important things to say, and I learned a long time ago, never get in the way or tick off a guy who sits on the Appropriations Committee. That's not a good thing to do. So um, you guys have all seen this. There are, uh, what I want to say is uh, uh, I worked for a short period of time in my career for a guy named Peter Drucker, and Peter always used to say, the, if the underlying fundamentals are good, invest in it. Well, I'm here to tell you that the underlying fundamentals in aquaculture are very strong, and they are strong for some very basic resource trends. We've got population going up. We've got standards of living going up, and uh, Michael alluded to this. I, I was at the Darden uh, corporate headquarters uh, a couple of months ago. Darden is the largest restaurant corporation in the world. They are concerned that they will not be able to outbid the Chinese in the marketplace for seafood. So they are investing in farms uh, around the world so that they can control their supply as opposed to going to the open market and purchasing it on the open market. The reason for that is precisely because of the increased standard of living in the BRIC countries, China, Brazil, and, uh, and India. And if people think that it's just population which is driving resource trends in this uh, world, uh, think again, standards of living are radically changing the amount of resources which are being drawn into other parts of the world, and they are going to impact us in America. In fact, they already are impacting us in America. There are three other trends which I think are important to not lose sight of, um, and they have to do with our ability to produce food on land. Uh, we are losing about 100,000 square kilometers a year in arable land. Uh, that is principally due to either bad agricultural practices, shifts in climate patterns, or in some cases urbanization. And in the United States, um, we're losing significant amount of agricultural land to urbanization. We are also, we also have two other fundamental trends that are happening. 87 percent of the world's aquifers are being pumped in excess of their recharge rate. I want to say that again. 87% of the world's aquifers are being pumped in excess of their recharge rate. That is principally for agricultural ir irrigation. We are essentially mining water, okay? That's a big deal. And if you talk to anybody in the insurance, in the insurance industry, anybody know the reason for the, the single largest reason for an insurance claim in the Midwest of the, of the United States in the last five years? It's subsistence. Okay, land is dropping, it's cracking foundations in buildings because we are pumping so much water that we're dropping land. Uh, the, other, the other thing that a lot of people don't know about um, but is a, is a big deal is uh, phosphorus reserves. Anybody know why we should be concerned about phosphorus reserves in the world? Known phosphorus reserves in the world at the current usage rate run out in 2050. What does that mean? The plants on the left were grown in a phosphorus deficient uh, uh, set of soils. The plants on the right were supplemented by normal uh, agricultural um, uh, fertilizer. So we are either going to find additional sources of phosphorus or we are going to learn how to recycle phosphorus or we are going to see significant decrease in productivity in, in terrestrial agriculture. So those trends, increasing population, concerns about agricultural production, 
are coming together and they are reflecting themselves very simply in food prices. And we're seeing uh, right this year food prices are down in the U.S., but the trend over the last 10 years ha has very definitely been an increase in food prices. And when you heard the Admiral earlier talk about why China um, was looking from a resource base uh, uh, and was concerned about their food prices, that's why. It's because if the price of food goes up, what happens? We throw the bums out, right? Talk about, um, think about the French Revolution. Uh, that was essentially a food crisis uh, that drove that uh, revolution. So food is important to the world and how we produce it um, is gonna drive a lot of, of what goes on in the next uh, uh, 50 to 100 years. This is the world food needs projected by, an, uh, the estimates vary from different groups, but everybody says basically we have to grow a lot more food in a relatively short period of time. Surface of the earth, obviously it's blue, it's water, uh, but the important point here I think is that 70% of the radiation that hits the earth is hitting an un currently unfarmed area, right? So if it takes water and sun and nutrients to grow food, uh, we have an enormous amount of space on the face of the globe where solar radiation is coming in, it's being used for natural uh, production, but we're not farming in those areas, and, th and that is an opportunity. This is to do with efficiencies. I put these numbers up. People are, are often shocked by them. This is just a comparison uh, in terms of conversion rates and the use of water in terms of producing aquatic versus land-based animals. They're to do with some very basic physiological uh, differences, um, and I, I won't get into that, but the point is that we can grow food in water in a very efficient f manner. That is true for both animals and for plants. And uh, uh, for those of you who are in the uh, agronomy world, you know that rice is the single largest consumed grain in the world. It happens to be the worst grain we could possibly pick to grow from a, a use of, of freshwater uh, resources. Rice farmers are gonna get better, they're gonna learn to recycle, but the reason rice farming is, is tough on fresh water is because it's grown in warm parts of the world and there's a high evaporation rate in those patties. And so uh, there are some inescapable realities there. Compare that to seaweed, which is in currently in Maine. That is one of our fastest growing uh, group of farms and there's virtually no fresh water used in seaweed production. We use just a tiny little bit in the hatchery phase um, as part of our, our um, when we're making some of the mediums that we grow the, uh, the small uh, juveniles in. Okay, so what I wanna suggest to you today, in my grandkids' generation, I will posit that we will grow as much food in water as we do on land. That's a pretty radical statement, and a lot of people have a hard time believing that, but if you look at what's happening around the world in aquaculture right now, it is not a crazy statement. We just have to get on the train uh, that many other parts of the world have already gotten on. This is a comparison of domestic um, sourced proteins, and you'll see um, that really aquaculture and seafood, we produce very little of, our, our, of what we consume in this country domestically. So for me, as a business person, that space between the 2% the, the that's produced in aquaculture and the 100% that we consume domestically, that's opportunity. That's, stu that's a place where I can go as a business person and, and, uh, and hopefully grow companies and employ people. I'm gonna end with two slides, um, what's holding us back and then how do we move forward? And uh, many of them are similar to what uh, Michael said. The one um, thing I wanna uh, talk a little bit about here is investor confidence. Um, a lot of people have uh, this concept about investor confidence that we look at spreadsheets and budgets and numbers and if the numbers work, we're confident and we invest. That is only part of the equation. A large part of what causes people to invest is their assessment of risk uh, and uh, their confidence that the regulatory climate is maybe going to be stable or not changing. And that is a big part of why we have not had the level of investment that we could have had in the U.S. is because investors have chosen to take their capital and go to other countries to invest in aquaculture. We have very significant American investment in aquaculture around the world. It is just, it has just not been made here. You heard this morning from Bill Dewey talk about Taylor's experience where they decided to invest in some farms in Canada. Um, but investor confidence is, this, is, is often misunderstood and it is very important. Um, and 
research institutions and government institutions oftentimes don't understand how much of an impact they have on investor confidence. And I'll give you an example. Um, we have uh, a series of institutions in Maine that, that have probably some of the best cold water marine aquaculture research facilities in the world. We have uh, 12 different uh, institutions and we have some of the best um, facilities in the world. We are attracting investment to Maine from outside the country and from outside the state precisely because we have that res research infrastructure there. Those investors are choosing to come to Maine because they don't have to capitalize that facility themselves. They can partner with an existing uh, uh, institution in Maine and uh, still benefit from those capacities. Uh, lack of risk management tools uh, is also an important one. Aquaculture is an uncertain business. Typically, the shortest production cycle we have is 14 to 19 months. Uh, if you have a, a, if you're growing an animal or a plant that has a three-year production cycle, that means you have three years of something in an in an environment that you have little or no control over. That's that's risk. In agriculture, we have lots of federal programs that allow terrestrial farmers to bet hedge, to control their risk. We need those same kinds of programs for aquaculture. I'm not talking about subsidies or crop uh, programs. I'm talking about risk management programs at the federal level that allow farmers to control their risk and, and survive the failure of a year crop. So what we need frankly, is a national aquaculture economic development plan akin to the space program. Uh, all these things are components of it, um, but what I, what I want to leave you with today is if we are serious about aquaculture in this country, uh, we need to invest seriously in it. And it's not just, and I, I apologize for offending institutional sensibilities, it is not just investing in the research community. We have done a great job of investing a lot of money in research in aquaculture in this country over the last 20, 25 years. We need to start to invest in economic development programs that are designed to stimulate investment from the private sector. So we need to change things like our tax um, uh, programs. We need to create incentive programs for investment uh, so that investors choose to invest here as opposed to Chile or Mexico or wherever else. Um, we need to put aquaculture in as a specialty crop under the uh, agricultural programs. That would allow us to, to access some programs in, under USDA. We need to exempt farmed products from the Lacey Act. The Lacey Act was designed to manage the trade of wildlife. Farmed animals and plants are not wildlife. They are domesticated private property that should not be regulated as wildlife. We need to uh, clarify who has authority over aquatic animal and plant health. There's a, right now we have three agencies that have authority, NOAA, USDA, and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. It needs to be one agency, and I would argue it should be USDA because they have the vets and the skills. And then uh, we need a crop insurance program, which is related to the risk management comments that I made earlier. And I will end there. Thank you.